Hi guys, and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. Today's case takes place on a cruise ship, and I'm sure some of you guys have actually traveled on cruise ships, but do any of you guys actually enjoy it? I've actually taken two vacations on cruise ships, both times I think were for like 10 to 12 days, but I was like 19, 20, and I had a great time. Um, but now when I think about traveling with kids, would I enjoy it? Have any of you taken your kids on cruise ships? I feel like young kids, I would just be so paranoid. Like, are they going to fall off the railings? Are they going to run away from me? People who just staring at my kids, they know where my kids are at all times. Like that would just be freaking me out the whole time. I think I'm just a really nervous person, but I never would have questioned going on a cruise, just Jay and I, especially for our honeymoon. Your honeymoon is one of the most exciting vacations you will ever take. And imagine you're about to embark on a 12 day cruise with the love of your life. You're having an amazing time. You're sharing new experiences. You're meeting new people until one day they disappear. Let's jump in and talk about the case of George Smith. By the way, you guys always comment on my eyebrows. I'm like, they're a little bit wild today. So let's just, let's move it along with the eyebrow comments, okay? They're a little bit crazy. George Allen Smith was born on 3rd of October, 1978. He grew up with his parents, George Sr. and his mother, Maureen, and he also had a sister named Bree. The family lived in Glenville, Connecticut, and his family also owned a successful liquor store in Coscob. George was tall. He was six feet three. He was handsome. He was athletic. He loved sports, especially basketball. He was popular. He was clean cut. He was smart. And his friends say he was a deep thinker. After high school, he attended college where he studied computer science and he received a business degree. Once he graduated, he got a job in a computer firm in Stamford, Connecticut, but he couldn't stay away from his family for too long. So he ended up moving back close to his family in 2003. And it was then that he told his dad that he just wanted to join the family business and work in the family liquor store. And his father was more than happy. George moved into an apartment close to the liquor store and he updated the computer system and he launched a website for the liquor store. George was great at anything electronic, especially computers. And he wanted to expand the store and launch online shopping. In the summer of 2002, George met a girl named Jennifer Hagel and they met while he was vacationing in Newport. Jennifer was the daughter of a realtor and an ex-policeman. Jennifer also really loved sports. She was a high school athlete. She played varsity soccer, basketball, and golf. She was really pretty. Her friends say she was always sort of made up and always looked nice. She was known to be a nice person and wanted to be a school teacher. Jennifer and George truly seemed like a great match. They got along really well. They were really in love and soon they moved into his apartment together and they got engaged. George was good looking and he had a bunch of women come into the liquor store to just like watch him but he was super loyal to Jennifer and he just wasn't interested. He would go to the gym every single morning. He loved to go out. He loved to have fun. He was just like any other 20 year old who just was living their life. George and Jennifer would get married three years later on 25th June, 2005. And his friends and family would describe it as a picture perfect storybook wedding. They got married at this place called um, the Inn at Castle Hill, which when I Googled it, it's like beautiful. It was on this cliff top. It was like an old Victorian castle that was being used for, for weddings. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful wedding. They were a really good looking couple and they had their future planned out. Things were looking great. For their honeymoon, they planned to take a 12 day cruise to the Mediterranean islands on board the Royal Caribbean cruise ship brilliance of the seas. And during this cruise, they were going to be stopping off at ports like Barcelona, the French Riviera, Rome, and the Greek islands. After the honeymoon, Jennifer was going to be starting a new job teaching third graders. So the day after their wedding, they flew to Barcelona. And then 
on the 29th of June, 2005, they were going to be boarding the ship. So I had to Google this ship, the brilliance of the seas, because I read that it was one of Royal Caribbean's biggest ships. They have like 19 ships and it's one of the biggest. So I looked it up and it has 12 passenger decks. It has over 850 crew members and can carry as many as 2,500 guests. And if you've never been on a cruise ship before, it's basically like just a floating city. So it's got a bunch of cabins for the guests. It has restaurant, bars, a casino, a health club, a mall, and it has a spa and a full service medical facility staffed by doctors and nurses. And I read that it even has like a small little jail. I'm sure every cruise ship has this, but this one in particular has like a small little jail for any unruly passengers. And I don't remember exactly how many people were on the ship that I've been on, but Royal, I, I did travel on Royal Caribbean. It was pretty big. Don't think it was 2,500. It had a mall and everything, but I feel like it would have been like 1,000, 1,500. George and Jennifer got a $10,000 package, which included a stateroom and it had a balcony overlooking the ocean. And the difference between the rooms, I think a stateroom has like a little lounge area. It's a little bit bigger. Bathrooms are a little bit bigger, has a double bed, things like that. But the room that I stayed in, cause I was with like my brothers, um, <laughs> had like bunk beds and a little toilet. So staterooms are much nicer, but $10,000, like, especially in 2005, this must've, been a really nice ship and they must have had a really nice room. Their room was 9062 and it was on the ninth deck. So when you board a cruise ship, every passenger, apart from like the kids, I'm guessing, get a key card. It's called a C pass. And it's basically like an electronic key, like most hotels have, but this one has your photo on it. So every time you use this card to leave and board the ship, they have people at the front of the ship, like before you leave, and they have a computer and when you scan this card, your picture pops up so they can confirm that the person leaving the ship and the person entering the ship is the same person that owns the key card. Same as buying alcohol or drinks on the ship, you present your C pass and the bartender will scan it and then your photo pops up and they're like, all right, this guy's good. He's you know old enough to drink. So it's basically an all rounder. It's your credit card, it's your identity, it's your room key. So you need to scan your C pass every time you approach your door, enter your room that way, like a hotel, but it also records the time you enter your room and the date and everything like that. So it stores a lot of information. It's very valuable. George and Jennifer's first port of call was the South of France. And people on the ship said that they were very friendly. They were a happy couple and they actually made friends pretty quickly with a lot of people, including another couple that was also on their honeymoon. Their names were Paul and Galina Gwitsniski. And um, this couple described them as down to earth, friendly, and they were in love. Through photos that they were taking, they appeared to be having an amazing first few days on the ship. They took lots of photos, you know, cuddling in the pool, having romantic dinners on these beautiful islands. And they just genuinely looked really happy and looked really in love like a couple on their honeymoon. On their second night on the ship, they had spent that day in France. And as they took off back into the seas, a man named Cletus Hyman, he was neighbors with George and Jennifer, and he was awake till almost 3.30 in the morning because of the excessive noise coming from Jennifer and George's room. It's not what you think. They were actually having a party in their room with a bunch of other 20 something year olds. So with the types of people on cruise ships, they kind of vary. So you can go on like a party cruise, right? Like you can kind of find those that are mainly for young people. There's no families there, there's no kids. It's kind of like a party cruise. Everyone drinks, you dance, you club, like that's what you do. But this cruise ship, the Brilliance of the Seas, this, you know, route they were taking attracted a lot of families and couples. So it wasn't just a young crowd, it was a mix. And a lot of these 20 year olds on the ship, they usually were traveling with their families on like family holidays, reunions, things like that. And the young people kind of just find each other because 
the families usually go to bed with their young kids and then the 20 year olds and stuff like that, they hang out on the cruise ship late at night. And in this uh, ship, a lot of the young people would hang out on deck six, which I believe was the solarium. And then they had a disco, like a club on deck 13. And George and Jennifer would often visit those places and meet these people there. And that's how they would invite them back to their room, which is strange. I've been on two cruise ships. I think I wouldn't even, this rooms are pretty small. They had a stateroom, so they had a bigger room, but they're still small. They're not like a hotel room. So it's strange to me that they invited um, strangers into their room. But again, they're in their 20s. I'm a loser. I'm not a partier. So I feel like that's what, you know, some people do. And that's what they did. So George and Jennifer were pretty friendly and they liked to party. So they did meet other like-minded people. And one of them was 20-year-old Josh Askin. And he was a college student from California. He was on the cruise ship with his parents celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. And the way Josh met them was when they were in Florence, they got off the ship and they both realized that, hey, we haven't organized a tour. So they organized a tour with, you know, Josh's family and George, George and Jennifer and a bunch of other people. And that's how they kind of like became friends. And then on the ship, they would continue to hang out. So that second night during the party in their room when their neighbor Cletus was annoyed at the excessive noise coming from their room. Josh was in their room along with another group of boys who were two cousins and a friend. And those boys were also vacationing with their family. So they were from Brooklyn, New York and Florida. And they, the three of them became known as the Russian boys. So that's how they referred to. It was 19 year old Gregory Rosenberg, his 18 year old cousin, Zachary. And then Zachary also had a 16 year old brother named Jeffrey. And then their older friend, 20 year old Rustislav, known as Rusty Kaufman. So the 16 year old Jeffrey, he hung around with them most of the time, I'm guessing during the day, but at night it was mainly the three boys, Greg, Zach, and Rusty who were hanging out with Josh and Jennifer and George. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> so after that excessive noise issue, Cletus goes to the front desk the next morning and he kind of complains about it and says, you know, what can be done? And the front desk tells him, okay, well, if it happens again, you know, give us a call and we'll handle it. So the honeymooning couple, George and Jennifer, Josh, the friend, and then the three Russian boys would become friends. People on the same cruise ship would say that those Russian boys, they were a little rough around the edges. They were just rowdy. They always tried to pick fights. They tried to steal alcohol from, you know, bars on the ship. They verbally abused the crew. They would stay up, you know, all hours of the night and fooled around in places they weren't supposed to be in. And then they would be reprimanded by crew members multiple times. Early on in the cruise, the Russian boys' parents were actually contacted and threatened by crew members that these boys would be disembarked at the next stop if their wild behavior would continue because they were caught by crew members early hours in the morning smoking in the solarium uh, of the cruise. And the solarium, from my memory, is like a pool. Um, I don't know why they call it a solarium, but it's like a pool area. It has like a little bar, um, like a little food area, things like that. It's kind of like a hangout zone. And they were smoking there, which, you know, understandable, but uh, they were not allowed to be doing that. And even after they were told by staff not to do it, they kept doing it. So they were threatened that, you know, you're going to be kicked off the cruise if you don't control them. So their parents were like, no, 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 I'm so sorry. You know, we promised that these kids are going to be supervised and there won't be any further problems. But the issue is the boys, the Russian boys, they had their own room. So how were the parents really going to supervise them? And they were like 19, 20. Look, to me, I was still supervised at that age. My parents were like, get your shit together. But, you know, maybe some families are different and how are they going to control these kids? They seem a little wild. So that's why they were doing those things. On 4th July, 2005, the ship stops at Mykonos and George and Jennifer, they get off the ship, they disembark and they spent the day exploring the beautiful islands. Mykonos is definitely on my bucket list. Once they got back on the ship, they had dinner. And then after dinner, 
they went to the casino. George and Jennifer were actually hoping to bump into that other honeymooning couple, Paul and Galena, but instead they spent much of their time at the casino gambling separately. Jennifer was at the blackjack table and George was teaching Josh how to play craps. And the three Russian boys, Gregory, Zach, and Rusty were also there that evening. And the ship was due to arrive at their next port the next morning, the Turkish town of Kusadasi. And it was going to be um, arriving around dawn. The next morning was 5th July, 2005. And Jennifer, she makes her way to the spa where she had already pre-booked a massage. Actually, it was a couple's massage, but George wasn't there with her. She arrived by herself. The staff say that she didn't seem concerned. And before her massage finished, she was paged on the ship's intercom to return back to her stateroom. At 8.30 a.m., a passenger reported seeing blood that was smeared on the canopy of a lifeboat that hung beneath George and Jennifer's room balcony. The stain, which was several feet long, was found on this like 12 foot wide metal protection canopy thing, which was protecting the lifeboats. The crew, obviously alarmed by this discovery, they checked all the rooms above these lifeboats that were hanging and the only people left to check was George and Jennifer. They wanted to make sure that this couple wasn't injured. So they found Jennifer had this pre-booked spa appointment. So they went and they asked her to come back to the room. So when she came back to the room, they asked her like, hey, where's George? Do you know where he is? And she tells them, no, I don't know where he is. And at this time it was discovered like, hey, wait, no one knows where George is. And is he even on the ship? And then an alarm was raised. At this point, the ship had docked in Kusadasi and Jennifer was escorted off by the Turkish police to be questioned. Josh Askin was also taken off the ship to be questioned by the Turkish police. They first had to confirm that George was even on the ship that night, that he had boarded the ship in Mykonos. And it was confirmed he was seen by witnesses that night. During Jennifer's interview with the police, she told them that she did not remember what had taken place the night before. She really had no memory of it. Jennifer states that she knows she drank a lot that night, but she can't ever remember ever being that drunk before. So police went and looked at CCTV footage from the ship and they see Jennifer and George along with Josh at the casino that night. Where was George? Using all the evidence available, the CCTVs, the key cards, the witness accounts, along with the crew's documentation, the following timeline was drafted. After they had dinner and went to the casino, at around 2.30 a.m., the casino closes. George, Jennifer, and Josh, together with the casino manager, Lloyd Botha, then all make their way to the cruise ship's disco. Josh then makes a statement to the police stating that in the elevator, he noticed Jennifer cozying up to the casino manager Lloyd. However, he states that George was too drunk to notice this. At 3.17 a.m., the disco bar records show that four shots were ordered at this time. The shots were given to George, Jennifer, and a third man, which I believe is Josh or Lloyd. Then the three Russians were also seen at the disco. Together, George, Jennifer, Josh, and the three Russians, they all began drinking from a bottle of absinthe. Absinthe is a highly potent green liquor that is illegal in most of the West and it isn't sold on the ship. And Royal Caribbean has suggested that this bottle was smuggled onto the ship against their rules. And before long, both George and Jennifer were very, very drunk. At 3.30 a.m., Josh states that George and Jennifer 
got into an argument, possibly because of how Jennifer was acting that night, how she was allegedly draping herself across random men, you know, flirting with um, Lloyd. And during this argument, Jennifer kicks George in the groin and then storms off. So now Jennifer has left the disco. And at 3.45 a.m., the disco has now closed. And George, at this point, was so drunk. He was too drunk to walk. So uh, Josh and the three Russian men then leave the disco to escort help George back to his room. When they get to George's room, however, Jennifer wasn't in the room. So George wanted to look for Jennifer. So he goes into his room and he changes his shirt and then the boys escort him to the solarium where they're looking for Jennifer but she wasn't there so because George was so drunk the boys they escort George back to his room and the sea pass shows that that room was accessed and entered at 4 2 a.m after this George Smith was never seen alive again. Then at around 4 a.m., that neighbor Cletus, he once again hears loud noises and possibly an argument coming from his neighbor, George and Jennifer's room. So he said it sounded like a drinking game and he pounds on the wall to get them to shut up. And he says the noise, it quietened down a little bit, but it still went on. So at 4 or 5 a.m., he calls security as he was instructed to by the front desk. And at 4.10, he hears loud voices, male voices, arguing on George's balcony. He then hears good night several times in English. And he hears movement from the balcony coming to George's cabin door. And George's door opens up. The male voices travel um, along into the hallway. So he then opens his cabin door and he looks outside And he sees three males walking down the hallway away from the room, not four males. It should have been Josh, Gregory, Zach, and Rusty leaving his room because they were the guys that escorted him to his room. Then roughly between 4.20 and 4.25 a.m., Cletus is back in bed. He's trying to sleep. And he states what he describes as a horrific thud. And it was so jarring that he felt the vibration in his bed. At 4.30 a.m., the security officers arrive at George's room responding to Cletus's complaint, and they knock on the door of room 9062, George and Jennifer's room, but they get no response, so they just leave. Okay, but where the hell was Jennifer? Jennifer left the disco at 3.30 a.m., so According to the floor plan, it should have taken her less than five minutes to get back to her room, but Jennifer did not get back to her room. And according to the three Russian men and Josh, when they took George back to his room, Jennifer was not in the room. It was later found that from the disco, Jennifer takes the elevator down to deck nine. And she was reportedly so drunk that she became disoriented. From the elevator, Jennifer was supposed to turn right into the corridor, which led to her room, but instead she turned left. She kept walking down that corridor. She ends up at a maintenance door and it was locked. So she slumped up against the wall and then she like slid down to the ground and she fell asleep. She was so drunk. It's alleged that she was either so drunk or she was possibly drugged that she blacked out. At 4.30 a.m., another security guard comes across Jennifer who's passed out and that was the same exact time that Cletus made the complaint on the phone. So after some instructions from the nurse on the ship, the security guard, he puts a wet paper towel on Jennifer's forehead to wake her up. After he does this, Jennifer wakes up. She tells the security guard she's okay and she gives them or him her room number. More security guards came and they tried to escort Jennifer back to her room but She was just too drunk. She couldn't walk. So two security guards, they go to Jennifer and George's room at 4.47 a.m. They knock on the door and they look inside, but no one was in the room. So then they leave and they come back to Jennifer. They grab a wheelchair. They put Jennifer in the wheelchair and they escort her back to her room. And she gets to her room at 4.57 a.m. 
So the officers entered Jennifer and George's room twice. Once before Jennifer arrived back in the wheelchair, they found no one there. And then when they brought Jennifer back in the wheelchair at 4.57 a.m., they placed Jennifer on the bed where she lay on top of the covers and she fell asleep. And none of the officers at the time noticed anything strange in the room No signs of a struggle, no blood, nothing. As they were leaving the neighbor Cletus, he sticks his head out of his room and he tells the security guards about his earlier complaint and he tells them, go back inside the room. And the officers say, well, we were just inside the room. Like we just went in there, nothing happened. Like there was nothing there. And Cletus is like, okay. And then he just goes back to bed. So once Jennifer was escorted back by the security guards, she sleeps for about three hours until eight o'clock. And when she woke up, she found no sign of George, but she had that pre-scheduled massage, remember? So she just makes her way onto this massage and she was just assuming that George was gonna meet her there. When Jennifer was questioned as to why she wasn't concerned that George never made it back to the room to sleep, she states that this wasn't the first time that George would be sleeping outside their stateroom, that he had slept outside the room at least on one other occasion. What a strange sequence of events on a ship where not much should really be allowed to happen. I mean, if Jennifer had just gone straight to the room, if she hadn't, you know, been disoriented and passed out at that maintenance door, if she had just gone straight to the room and, you know, when the boys brought George inside the room, Jennifer would at least have been a witness as to what was happening, you know, if George was about to have an accident, she could have called for help immediately. If he was a victim of foul play, she might have also been able to prevent that. Or she may too have ended up missing. The night he went missing, as they set sail, the ship covered over 200 miles. George or his body could be anywhere. When Josh was questioned, he stated that after dropping George back to his room, him and the three Russian boys each returned to their own room. So I believe Josh was with his parents. So he went to his parents' room and then the three Russian boys and I believe the 16-year-old shared one room. So they went back to their rooms and they ordered room service. But the Turkish police, when they investigated this, they spoke to the crew members who would be responsible for delivering room service. They said that, yes, calls were made regarding an order for room service, but no food was actually recorded anywhere as having been delivered to the boys, by the crew at least, which is kind of, again, another strange event because when does that happen on a cruise ship? I mean, you make an order for room service, room service comes and delivers your food. So it's unclear whether an order was actually made or they attempted to order and then they never actually ordered and that's why no food is recorded to have actually been delivered to their room? Or did they place an order for food and the person, the crew member delivering the food just never recorded it? After being questioned by the Turkish police, Josh then reboards the cruise ship and to continue his parents' 25th wedding anniversary celebration while Jennifer had to call her family and George's family back home to let them know what had happened. She then boards a flight back home And 48 hours later, George is declared likely drowned at sea and his remains were never found. So it seemed like the cruise just went on as usual. But several days later, Josh, Greg, Zach and Rusty were all expelled from the ship. And this was due to them allegedly a female passenger and recording the encounter on a camcorder they had with them. An 18-year-old female passenger on the ship claimed that she was in the Russian's room and she was intoxicated, very intoxicated, and she claimed that she was having blackouts. And in between blackouts, she remembers having non-consensual sex with Greg, Rusty, and even Jeffrey. 16 year old brother. I'm not sure if Zach was involved in this, but later Rusty's lawyer said that the sex was all consensual and Josh, he was in the room 
he didn't have sex with this woman, but he was present at the time. The Italian police investigated this because that's where they disembarked and they reviewed this footage, but they actually declared that no rape had occurred and the men and their families were then put on a flight home back to the US. Now, there's not much more to be said about this tape because I was trying to find out what exactly, you know, got them, like what made the authorities say, no, 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 this isn't rape. And the reason for this is that during the video, while the girl is with one of the guys, the guy filming, I think it's Zach that's filming this actually from memory, it's Zach that's filming it. And he's asking this girl questions and she's answering these questions while each guy is with her. So I think that's what, you know, saved them. But on that camcorder, a further incident was recorded. Josh and the Russian men were the last people to see George alive, yet they were only questioned for 10 minutes by the Turkish police. This second incident that was revealed on the camcorder, Josh was not present. It was just the Russian boys. And in the video, they're talking about George's death. They seem to be at a lunch and this footage is recorded after they are interviewed by the Turkish police. And they're sitting around at lunch and they're just talking about um, the incident about how George is missing and they're laughing and joking about him dying and how rich he was. Rusty then makes a comment stating how George went parachute riding off his balcony. Greg then stands up at the end of the video. He hunches his shoulders. He flashes some gang signs. He says, told ya I was gangster. Sort of insinuating and bragging about doing something to George. So let's talk about what exactly the evidence showed. What evidence was left behind? Along with the CCTV footage of George's last moments, they found some biological evidence on the balcony of his room. Now, this biological evidence that was found on his balcony, they said it could be blood, semen, or any other type of bodily fluid, but it wasn't indicated exactly what type of biological evidence was found. The blood that appeared on the canopy of the lifeboat, it appeared that something was either drug through the blood or slid off it, like it was smeared. And there was also an area on the canopy where the blood was more dense and collected, almost like it would have been coming from a main wound, like where the main wound would have been bleeding from. And if it was on the front side of George, if he had hit his head or something like that, and he grabbed the overhang of the canopy, it would explain that bloody handprint that was found. But weirdly enough, right? This blood was removed by the ship's cabin crew. Then they also found a bloody handprint along the railing where that initial stain had been spotted. And it's really hard to describe, but I couldn't find any photos of like a diagram of the brilliance of the seas to explain it. But something that I just found weird, the balcony of each of the rooms, they just hang like over the ocean, you know? And it's like, in terms of, I don't know, like making sure your passengers are safe. I feel like balconies should overhang like a deck you know, because even if you slipped and fell, if you're drunk, because there's no, there's no um supervision, right? So it's like kind of wild that you can just have a, like you can just be dangling over the sea for days. It's, it's weird. The last piece of blood that was found was two tiny little lines of blood found on George's bed sheets. The possibility that George's death was an accident was also looked at. Witnesses on either side of George's room, so the neighbors, they noticed that the balcony had chairs on it. And one of the chairs, one of the metal chairs on the balcony was turned around, so facing the bedroom. The back of the chair was near the railing and the railing was four foot tall. So did George sit up on the railing, you know, have his feet on the metal chair? 
to have a cigarette? Did he fall when he was doing that? The FBI became involved shortly after George's disappearance and they began a lengthy investigation and they found a lot of stuff that the Turkish police missed. So the FBI was the one that found all of that other blood that I mentioned. The Turkish police basically just found the canopy blood, but the FBI found that extra blood, the blood on the bed sheet, the balcony, the canopy. And the FBI believed that the blood pattern for found on the canopy was in the shape of a man. And usually when they investigate these cruise ship accidents, if people fall off, you know, there's very little blood, if any. And this basically just proved that George had already been bleeding badly when he landed on the canopy and possibly slipped and fell into the ocean. George's family arrived in Europe by the end of that week and they appeared on TV appealing for any information relating to George. They handed out flyers to cruise ship passengers. They just tried to find any information as to what happened to George. They openly criticized Jennifer for leaving the investigation so soon, for not returning back with them. Both Jennifer and George's family at the time both believed that George had been murdered. For them, this was supported by the evidence found on the ship as well as the ear witnesses. George's family believes that these Russian men, they had a motive that George and Jennifer, they both dressed well. George had this expensive Bretling watch and people stated that George and Jennifer sort of flashed their money. Many people heard them talking about the thousands of dollars of wedding money they had in their room. His family believes this is the Russian men's motive to kill George. The family believes that that night, the men were given an opportunity to rob George as offering to put him to bed while he's so heavily intoxicated would make him less likely to argue or fight them back. The theory is that the loud argument that Cletus heard was the men arguing who was going to stay back in the room and steal the money and George's watch. This also supports the theory that one man was in the room because Cletus only saw three men leaving George's room when there were four men that escorted him in. But the men's attorneys argue that Rusty, he was a pretty wide guy. And when they were walking down the hallway, Cletus just didn't see the fourth guy in front of Rusty because he was kind of like blocking the hallway and the fourth guy was in front of uh, Rusty. But his family still believes that one person was supposed to stay behind in the room with George and look for the money and steal his watch. And then George's family also has a theory about those two tiny lines of blood that was found on George's bed sheets. The family lawyer states that, you know, when you're taking off a watch and they've got those two clasps, and if you're going to pinch those clasps off, but the clasps pinch the skin, those lines of blood directly align up with where you would be getting a pinch on your wrist from a watch. So the theory is that while they were doing that, George wakes up and he's like, what are you doing? A fight ensues, which is consistent with the neighbors hearing, you know, loud noises coming from their room. And then George goes overboard. People hear a loud thud. Cletus especially says the sound was very loud. And this is consistent with George being such a big guy that he would make a big sound. So what really happened to George? George's family has stated that they will not rest until they know what happened to George. They have accused Royal Caribbean of not preserving the crime scene, but the captain of the ship denies those accusations. The captain says as soon as they knew that George was missing, they contacted the authorities. They made the cabin available to them. They secured the cabin as well as the uh, stained area of the canopy. They allowed Turkish police to come on board the ship and conduct a full forensic investigation. They allowed blood samples to be taken. Uh, they allowed dusting for fingerprints and other evidence that was collected from the ship and then subsequently handed over to the FBI, who then continued investigations of this case. But the Smith family is also critical of the Turkish investigation. They claim the Turkish police was only there for three to four hours to conduct this investigation and only took statements from six people. The Russian men were only interviewed for 10 minutes and then Cletus, the neighbor, was not interviewed at all. 
They also claimed that Royal Caribbean rushed the Turkish police off the ship because they needed to make their next port of call on time. They claimed that the ship sailed off into the sunset with the potential murderers still on board, potentially putting everyone's lives at risk. That in Turkey, they failed to lock the ship down once they discovered George missing early in the morning. They allowed passengers to disembark and board the ship freely And this could result in potential evidence being taken off the ship, disposed of in Turkey. His family also doesn't understand why more wasn't done with Josh, Zach, uh, Greg, and Rusty. They stated a videotape with a potential was in their possession, whether it was consensual or not. You know, the boys, their actions on the ship, their behaviors were supported by other witness accounts and they were reckless and there is possibly potential evidence that these guys are withholding. The attorneys for the boys, for Rusty, Greg, Zach, stated that the boys have been interviewed by the FBI multiple times and claims their clients did nothing wrong. Moving on to Jennifer. As time went by and the investigation got deeper, she grew more distant and more argumentative with George's family. And they claimed that one time, She was really angry with them because they used a cropped photo of just George in his missing posters as opposed to a photo of the two of them. And I think that can be taken in many different ways, but, you know, oh, she wanted a picture of herself to be known. But at the same time, maybe she wanted a picture of herself with George because that's how people would more likely recognize them as a couple. In 2006, George's family hired a private investigator and he claimed He had information that indicated that there was a videotape that existed, another one, and that this videotape showed Jennifer having sex with other men on the cruise ship prior to the night that George went missing. But this tape failed to be located, but the family alleges that It's in the possession of Royal Caribbean. I couldn't find any more information on this. So it's all alleged, but I don't know. Like George went missing on the second night or the third night of the, of the cruise. She was having sex with all these men on the first day of their honeymoon. Come on. In late 2006, Jennifer won a lawsuit against the Royal Caribbean and accepted $1.1 million as a settlement. And this was way more than the $70,000 that um, cruise ships at the time were required to pay for any incidences that occurred on the ships. And um, after receiving this settlement, Jennifer made a statement stating that George most likely died as a result of a drunken incident. However, George's family alleges that Jennifer only accepted this settlement to hide any details of sexual activity that she was involved in during the cruise. They also felt that $1 million was not enough as a settlement, that by Jennifer accepting this, it was basically giving up on the chance to find more information about George because now the matter's closed, right? Royal Caribbean doesn't have to do anything else. His family just felt like Royal Caribbean was covering up the whole thing. However, at the time, Jennifer claimed her loyalty to George and that she would be using some of the money to pay legal fees and set up a fund in George's name. George's family actually took Jennifer and Royal Caribbean to court over this matter, but it was dismissed by the courts. In 2007, just under two years after George went missing, Jennifer went back to her maiden name, Jennifer Hagel, and she ended her search for George. In 2009, she remarried and went on to have three children. In 2015, Jennifer's family made a statement saying they could not be happier that Jennifer had moved on with her life. In 2010, one of the Russian men, Greg Rosenberg, he went to prison for trafficking oxycodone and he served three years behind bars. He claimed he did this because he had expensive taste and he loved watches, clothes, and jewelry. 15 years after George went missing, In 2020, Greg was murdered outside his home by an unknown person. 10 years later in 2015, the FBI officially closed George's case as they believed they did not have enough evidence 
to prove it was a homicide and not an accident. What a sad ending to a marriage that lasted 11 days. A sad, tragic life for his family. What an end to poor George's life. Just imagine, just the thought of being thrown or falling overboard off a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean, especially at night, you're alone in the sea. Are you conscious, even unconscious? It's like, what a scary, terrifying experience. Oh my God, the thought. There are a few theories about what happened to George and one was that he did fall off his balcony while sitting on it smoking. Like, damn, what incredible timing for that to happen, right? Because so many people stopped by around that same time that he would have been doing this. The security guards twice, then Jennifer, then even the neighbor was like, go check on him and just no one happened to do so. But the falling off the balcony theory, right? Like, If he fell, he would have had to be conscious. So when he fell, wouldn't the neighbors have heard a scream? Even like a, whoa, you know, like if he was that drunk, he still would have made some noise falling off a balcony. I don't think, I mean, when you're drunk, does your fear factor go away? If he was hurt by one of his new friends, did they find if anything was stolen? I mean, are you really going to murder someone just for a bretling? I'm guessing the money wasn't stolen because that was never, that would have still been in the room and his watch was never found. So did they steal it or did it stay with George? I do find it weird though when people befriend people they barely know so quickly and let them into their personal space. Hell no, are you entering my room number one? And hell no, am I drinking with people I barely know? Being in a vulnerable state with people I barely know is just a scary thought. I hope one day for George's family, we do find out what happened to him because I feel like they're never going to be able to live the rest of their life with any sort of happiness. Not knowing what happened to their son. Like, it's just horrifying. Jennifer seems to be getting a bad rap online, but did she do anything wrong? What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments below and I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.